Well, we want to welcome you today to our 1130 Wednesday luncheon Bible study. I hope uh, you will listen to us while you're eating and We're not able to do it here because of the COVID. We're still under COVID-19 restrictions, but we kept our 1130 study for you so that we could continue this one day again. If you have your Bibles, open to John 15. John 15. And we're going to look at verses because we're in a study called the Foundation Doctrines of the Holy Spirit. Uh, during the Last Supper period, uh, which will cover John 14 through 17, uh, or John 13 through 17, that period there, uh, we, uh, we, we are referring to it as the Last Supper period. Now, there were, you know, there was messages spoken to the disciples at the, at the Last Supper, the literal Last Supper with Jesus, and then uh, in uh, the Mount of Olives, and then at Gethsemane. But we're calling that whole, so that we can just keep them, se se we, we call that whole the Last Supper period, John 13 through 17. And during that, during that Last Supper, on his way to the cross, the burial and resurrection, and then the post-resurrection appearances, before he went to the cross, he taught them, he taught his disciples seven foundational doctrines amidst a lot, of, a lot of categorical doctrine that he was teaching them. In the midst of that, he was teaching them on specific foundation doctrines of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and he, he, the reason is that when he leaves the earth and goes back to heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, exalted to the right hand <clears throat> with the glory that he he has as God. He would send the Holy Spirit and implement this in the life of every church age believer, these, these seven major doctrines. So we've been studying them. Today I talk about the third one that he, he spoke on. I'm in chapter 15. If you'll go with me down into verses 25, 26, 27. And it reads, but they have done this. He's, he's talking about the greater passage is 18 through 27. That's the greater passage. And Jesus is talking to his disciples about the hostility of the world against him and the believers that follow him, Christians. And so he lays out a blueprint of what he and his followers, the Christians and Christianity, would have from the time of his de death on the cross to his second coming. In other words, during that entire church age period, the church of Christianity, the church and Christianity, is going to suffer, suffer great hostility. And that starts in verse 18. And in the midst of that, he's going to talk about the importance of the indwelling ministry of the testimony of Christ to the believer and from the believer to the world. In verse 25, 26, 27. But when they had done this in order that the word may be fulfilled, go back to verse 20. I'll just drop back quickly to 23. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them, the world, the works which no man ever else did they would not have sin but now that's the purpose Christ came into the world but now that they have both seen and hated me and my father as well verse 25 but they have done this in order that the word of God may be fulfilled that is written in their law and he, he's quoting uh, Psalms 69:4. Uh, they hated me, watch this, without a cause. They hated me without a cause. Verse 26 is when the Holy Spirit comes, Pentecost and following, 
when the comforter comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, and here's, here's our message, that is the spirit of truth. That's a title for the Holy Spirit's ministry during the church age under the new covenant. That is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will bear witness of me and you will bear witness also because you have been with me from the beginning. So we're going to talk about that. He's speaking specifically to disciples. We're included in that, in that when he comes, he will be the great witness to us and from us. Let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality would be personal sin. Could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. You must confess these to get out of carnality and back into spirituality, which is the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. The cleansing takes us to the cross of Christ where his blood cleanses us from all sin. For the unbeliever, it removes Adamic sin, the 13 judicial charges of Adamic sin, which you can read on our website if you're interested. When they believe that, those are removed from the, his life. And for the believer, the blood of Christ works to restore us to spirituality, not salvation. That's for the unbeliever. But for spirituality, that's for the believer. The working, the cleansing work of Christ from the cross extended to the Christian life. Uh, to recover from carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sin. When I confess that, I'm restored to spirituality, and that's the key. That's the key to Bible study. We, we studied last week how the, in John 14, uh, 25, 26, that the Holy Spirit would, when he comes, he will teach and recall the word of God from our souls. So that's a very important principle. Well, today, uh, we're going to look now at the subject matter of chapter 15, verses 26, 27. But remember, I included 26 because he says, they have done this hostility, the world in hostility against Christ and Christianity, in order that the word might be fulfilled, that it was written in a messianic Psalm 69, they, the world, hate me without a cause. They will hate you without a cause. He said, if they hate me without a cause, they will hate you without a cause. I mean, sometimes it's difficult to know why somebody hates you uh, because th th there's no rhyme or reason to it. That's what Jesus is dealing with. The world, because of your identity with Christ and his identity with their sin, they're going to hate you. Now, their sin, they find pleasure in it, but there's also judgment in it. Uh, both, both in time and eternity. I mean, it has consequences. Sin has consequences. Uh, and so Christ came uh, to die for sin on the cross. He died for the sinner, sin. You know, like, like uh, Luke 19.10, he came into the world to, to save sinners. Uh, Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.16, he came into the world to save sinners, among whom I was the chief. I, I was, well, we all probably feel that way once we get saved, I suppose. Well, let's take a look at this um, uh, today. I, I want you to, to, I want you to focus on a few words. Uh, back, let's go back to, to uh, 15. Uh, Down in verse 26 of chapter 15 of John, when the comforter comes, when the comforter comes, he's not going to come to dwell inside the believer. The, this message started John 14, 16, 17, and then carried on in 25, 26. Now it's in the 15th chapter. He's back to the subject matter, and he's going to cover it again in 16. He's going to be back to the subject matter. You see, the key is when. When will when the, when the helper comes, when will that be? 
Well, Jesus, John 16, 7 through 11, Jesus Christ has got to go back to the Father, and then the Holy Spirit will be sent, as he mentions here. Uh, when he comes, the Spirit of truth, when he comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me. That's what we're after. He will bear witness of me. Verse 27, you will bear witness also because you have been with me. And, and so there's our issue. So today we're going to look at four aspects. We're going to look at four aspects of what it means to have the testimony ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit in us, to us. It ministers to us and through us. Ministers to us and then through us to the world. The first, one of the first things I want to do in this study today is I want to examine the passage, John 15, verse 20, uh, the greater context. Remember, the greater context of my, my verses, my verse is 26, 27, but the greater context is 18 through 27. So I want to break that down for you. For example, in, in verses 18 through 21, Here's what Jesus said. Now, this is set in this whole, we have to read the whole thing to get the point that we're after the witness of the Holy Spirit. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. That's the theme. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. They wouldn't hate you. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. That, and that's the reason. Now, they're going to do that. It's not the reason in their mind because they hate you without a cause, no rhyme or reason. Then he goes on in verse 19, and that was verse 18, in verse, nine, uh, verse 20. Remember the word that I said to you a slave, back in earlier teachings, remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to go from hate. Hate is going to produce persecution of Christianity. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute, persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Then he goes to verse 21. But all these things, that's the hatred, the hostility of hatred and persecution of Christ and, and his followers. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, for the sake of Christ. You're going to bear witness in you and through you. And that witness is going to bring hostility from the world to you. We see it in America today. I, I, you'd have to be asleep not to see it. All these things they will do to you for my name's sake. We call that undeserved suffering. You need to read Philippians 129. It has been granted by God for you to be saved and to suffer for Christ's sake. For my, for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. Then he comes to verse 22 through 24. Actually, 25, but I'm going to go through 24 with it. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. See, he's really going to get into that in John 16, 7 through 11. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had, verse 24, if I had not done among them the works which no, no one else did, they would not have sin. In other words, he identified himself to be a sinless person. He who is without sin, you see, he who is without sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the point.
they would not have sinned, but now they have both seen and hated me and my father's will. But they have done this in order that the word may be fulfilled that is written in their law, a messianic law, a messianic passage. They hated me without a cause. And of course, then that brings us. And in point number one on your paper, I have made, I put an outline for you. I did a homiletical outline. I did it S words, servant. I did servant in verses 18 through 21. The servant of Christ will be persecuted by the world. And I gave you Philippians 129. That's the servant. Now the spiritual. In verses 22 through 24, there will be spiritual conviction of sin of the world by the witness of Christ, by the testimony of Christ in me. What happened to your life, Ron Adema? I believe that Jesus died one day. I believe that Jesus died for my sins that separate me from a holy God, and that he was buried, and on the third day of his burial, he was raised from the dead to give me life everlasting. And he changed my heart. He changed my heart. The Bible is filled with stories of people who have been born again and their hearts have been changed. They're different people because they have been born of God. They've been born of the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God speaks the truth of God to them and through them. It's a marvelous thing. And we'll read it again in John 16. This is why, why we carry the gospel in Matthew 28, 18 through 20 is why we carry the gospel throughout the entire world. We carry the gospel to every nation. Christianity has always done it. From Pentecost forever, because of the indwelling testimony of the Holy Spirit of God, we carry the gospel as ambassadors for Christ everywhere. We carry it to our family. We carry it to our neighborhood. We carry it to our schools. We carry it to our communities. We carry it throughout our nation and from our nation to the rest of the worlds of nations. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we do that because our hearts have been changed. We're not the same person we were. Listen, I'm not the same person today I was yesterday because of transformation, the renewing, the constant renewing of my soul. I am not, I don't expect to be the same person I was yesterday. That's transformation is conforming me to the image of, of the person of Jesus Christ. My life is, is, should be filled with humility and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. These are not something, these are th things that I keep out there as a benchmark the Holy Spirit produces them under the ministry of the Word of God. I mean, I don't set out to do all those things. I walk in the Spirit and I walk by faith and God does these things. He, he transforms your life. Once your heart has changed, once you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are born again. Your, your soul is born into, in, into spiritual life. It bothers the Christian even to be carnal. He could never be lost. I mean, the, the change that comes in your life from being lost, from, from lost from a relationship with a holy God. There's no way to even compare them. But see, there's another step in that, and that's the transformation bringing bringing my life out of Ron Adaman into the person of Jesus Christ. The, the, the more you're with me, the more you should see Jesus and the less you should see of Ron Adama. And that's a benchmark that I have to work on. I work on it by walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, and I, I work on it by, by walking in the power of the Word of God. I don't, I don't depend to, I don't work on it within my own structure of my self-confidence and my flesh and all of that. I don't do it. That's not the way it's done. 
you've got to understand this, and this is the importance of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, you remember that? And when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me to you, and you will bear witness from you to the world that hates you, hates Christ. The more you talk about Jesus, the farther you're going to be separated from these people who don't want to hear it. And you know why they don't want to hear it? Because their life is involved in sin. And they know within their own spirit that that separates them from God. And they can't do that and have a relationship with God. The church has become so polluted and diluted that people can live in sin in the church and not be confronted within their own spirit. I'm not talking about sticking a finger at them and pointing and being judgmental. I'm talking about people who claim to be Christians, who live in open, rebellious sin against God and his word. And they seem to be okay in the church with it. And the church seems to be okay with it. This is something's wrong when the Holy Spirit is not bringing great conviction on the hearts of people. We need a good dose of revival today in our hearts. You know, one of the interesting things in this passage, when you, when you look at 18 through 27, is you, you look at the word if. I, I just want to show you something. For example, in verse 18 and verse 20, the word if, if the world hates you, verse 20, if they persecuted me. In the Greek language, there are four different ifs to identify something really important. This is, this is a second-class condition. If the world hates you, and it does, you know that it, had ha it hated me before it hated you. And you should know that. You should know it because he told you that. You don't have to tell it over you over and over and over and over again. And, and you should know that they hate you without cause. Right. The, the, the second class condition is contrary to fact. I mean, why do you hate me? If the world hates you, why does it hate you? Why, that, that's, I said a second-class condition. It's a first-class condition. It's true. That's both, both verse. Both they hate and they persecute are first-class conditions, and it's true. If the world hates you, and it does, know that it hated me before it hated you. That's a, princi that's a doctrinal principle. Also, in, in verse... Um, in, in uh, verse, let's see, in verse 20, not 21, in verse 22 and in verse 24, we have, we have a second class condition. A second class condition. The second class condition is, is what I, I mentioned, for, is contrary to fact. Verse 22 and 24. Watch why he used it. If I had not come, but of course I have, and spoken to them, they would not have had sin, but of course they do. But now they have no excuse for their sins. He who hates me hates my father. Now he comes back to a second class. If I had, if I had not done among them the works which no one else has did, but I did, he performed miracles, unbelievable miracles. They would not, they, uh, verse 24, they would not have sin. You see, the, see, see what he's done here? In verse 22 and 24, he's dealt with sin. Dealt with their sin. And he changed it from a first-class condition to a, to a second-class condition, contrary to fact. See, so he's trying to teach you. He's trying to teach you and I Something about it. Look at. And who runs the world? First John 5, 19. Satan. He runs the world. 
He hates God. He hates God's program. He hates anybody as a follower of God through Jesus Christ. I mean, the only way you can get John 14, 6. John 14, John 14, 6. No man comes to the Father except through me, the Son. Well, here's the second point. I just want to show you the greater context of the great testimony. When the testimony comes to you and from you to the world, the world's going to hate you like they hated Jesus. Hello, Christianity. Okay? Who are you to talk about sin? One who was a sinner. Listen, certainly a sinner can talk about sin, but when they give the solution to sin is where the world hates you because it brings you to Christ. See, if I just identify as a sinner with a sinner, there's no big deal. But when I identify that the sinner is out and the saint is in, that I've been redeemed, I've been bought with the price of the blood of the only begotten Son of God who died and was buried and raised to give me life everlasting. What is that life everlasting? It's the life of God that lasts forever. You tell the world that, and they think that you're picking on them because of their sin. You're trying to tell them that there is a solution to your sin problem, and your heart can be changed if you'll believe the gospel because the Holy Spirit will come in, and he will bring transformational work in your life. You will be transformed, not reformed, transformed. You need to read Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 2. God's answer to the hostility of the world against Christ and Christianity is the gospel of grace salvation through Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. How am I saved? Romans 1, 16. I must believe the gospel is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes the gospel. When I believe that Jesus died for my sins, was buried and raised for my eternal life, I get saved. I get saved by grace through faith and not of myself. It is a gift from God, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Isn't that wonderful? See, that's the power of John 3, 16. When you know that, then John 3, 16 has a lot of meaning to you as a believer. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish. See, perish is one of the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin against the human race. Gosh, people, you need to read Romans 5, verses 12 through 21. Come on. I mean, why is the church engaged in worldwide evangelistic ministry? Because it changed our life. We want to carry the message because of the life transfer. It's not about sin. It's about salvation. It's what you're delivered from that the message is so important. A worldwide ministry of evangelism will be executed by the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit from the lives of of individual church age believers. Isn't that marvelous? Acts 1 8 tells you start evangelizing where you are in Jerusalem. Go to Judea. That would be like this, the Birmingham to Alabama. And then stretch out to the south. And then stretch out to the nation. And then go to all the worlds, all the other nations of the world. I mean, do you not do you not understand Acts one eight? I mean, Pentecost is coming; it's going to blow. Acts one eight was stated before Pentecost. He said he gave him he gave him Acts one eight and said it's going to this is going to come in just a few days, ten days. It's Pentecost. The church has been on fire for world evangelism ever since Pentecost. It wasn't Paul. It was Pentecost. They're both P words, but they're, they're different. Paul, listen, Paul ain't going to get converted unless we have Pentecost. 
He, he's going he's to have eight works of the Holy Spirit because of Pentecost. Pentecost, Acts, the second chapter, Pentecost comes, verse 1. When you read verses 32 through 41, you get a gospel message. Peter stands up and preaches the clearest gospel message, 22 through 41. When you get to verse 41, an invitation is extended, and 3,000 people got saved at Pentecost. In verse 47, Acts 2, you're going to hear that people were being added to the church daily because of evangelism that broke out at Pentecost. When you go to the fourth chapter of Acts, this evangelism that started Pentecost is still going on, and it's moving down the road. It's going from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and to uttermost parts of the earth. When you get to the fourth chapter of Acts, of verse 4, you've got 5,000 people saved. When you get to the eighth chapter, you've got Philip. He's on a way. He's, he's just come out of a great meeting, uh, an evangelistic meeting where many were saved in Samaria, entire towns and villages. And he's on his way to more missionary work when the Holy Spirit tells him to take a side road and he thinks that's silly to do that because it would take him off course. But he's obedient to the Holy Spirit who witnesses to him that there's ministry down the road. He don't see it. It's a dead-end road as far as he's concerned from what his plans are. But yet he's obedient to walk in the Spirit. When he gets down there, he finds an Ethiopian eunuch sitting in a chariot from a foreign country who doesn't understand what he's experienced at Pentecost and the whole holiday where Christ died, buried, raised, the whole thing all the way from, Pente from, uh, from uh, the Passover uh, to uh, Pentecost. And he's trying to piece it all together. He doesn't, can't understand the gospel and how, how a person is saved and what's all that mean. And Philip pulls up next to him and and stops and says, can I help you? And the guy said, yeah, I don't understand what I've just witnessed and seen. I don't understand it. And Philip is able to explain to him the gospel of Jesus Christ in simple terms. Christ came and died on a cross. He was buried. He was raised from the dead on the third day. If you believe it, you're saved. The guy got saved, got baptized, and became a missionary to Ethiopia. And Philip went on his way preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where did that begin? Where did that begin? It began at Pentecost. It didn't begin with Paul. It began at Pentecost. When you get to the ninth chapter, Paul gets saved. He's out. He hate, he's full of hostility. He hates Christ. He hates the Christians. And he's out to destroy them. And he gets converted. And God calls him not to go to the Jew. He calls him. He sent Peter to the Jew. He sends Pete to the, uh, Paul to the Gentiles. Listen, he already told, told that to Peter in Acts 10 and 11. Paul got saved in Acts 9. Paul, uh, God, the Lord told Peter to get his eyes open to the greater ministry that God had, had died for all mankind, not just for the Jew. That's Acts 10 and 11. When we get to 12, 13 and forward, the rest of the book of Acts, we got Paul. But before we had Paul, we had Pentecost. My, 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 people. <clears throat> Paul would be ashamed the way some of you talk about Paul. He'd be ashamed. Because you don't pay attention to the word of God. He'd be ashamed of you. What happened between Acts 2 and Acts 13? My, my craziness. This worldwide evangelism began at Pentecost. We'll go to the second coming of Christ until the church is removed from the earth. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. You know the wonderful thing about all this is that one of the works of the Holy Spirit, one of the works of the Holy, eight, one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit 
is to seal you unto the day of redemption. Ephesians 1, 13, 14, and verse 30. Sealed. That's what it means to be saved. Sealed unto the day of redemption. Sealed. When, when did I get that sealing? The moment I believed the gospel of Christ. I was sealed unto the day of redemption. Don't anybody think they can break that seal. That seal is greater than the Roman seal on the tomb. Worldwide evangelism. Acts 4.32. And with great power, the great power. You know where that came from? Pentecost, the Holy Spirit. And with great power, the apostles, the apostles, watch this, were giving witness. Where'd that come from? Came from the indwelling Holy Spirit. His job is to witness to and from. Here's 2 Thessalonians 1.10. And when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day, second coming, and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. You know how important, you know what's going to be important in the second coming of Christ? All the people that you and I have borne the witness to Jesus Christ in salvation. How many people we've witnessed who have believed. That's what the second coming is all about. To the church. Point number three. The indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit will testify personally to the church age believer and through the church age believer. That's our passage. John 15, 25 through 27. The indwelling Holy Spirit will give testimony of God's grace message as well as the grace, as, as well as God's grace invitation to salvation. Isn't that wonderful? In other words, the testimony, the testimony that the Holy Spirit bears witness to us and from us is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how a person can be saved, how a person can, can be saved. He's a sinner and needs to be saved. He's not a sinner because he sins. He sins because he's a sinner. He's a sinner because of Adam's sin. We're all that way. The only person that wasn't a sinner wasn't born under Adam's genealogy of sin which was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was virgin born. He didn't come through the natural channel. Oh, yeah. The indwelling Holy Spirit will give testimony of God's grace message of the gospel and his grace invitation to salvation and what it does. Jesus said in John 6, 63, the testimony is this, that Christ has come to give you life, John 10.10, 10, and to give it to you more abundantly. Isn't that a marvelous life? He came to give you life. He could have removed your spiritual death. You can read about that in Romans 5, 12 through 21. He's going to remove your spiritual death, which would send you to hell. And he's going to give you spiritual life, which will send you to heaven. <laughs> what do you have to do to get it? You got to believe that the, the gospel, that Christ died for your sins personally, was buried and raised from the dead third day. And that ought to be, listen, and the Holy Spirit will give testimony to that witness that that's true based on the word of God. And that message you carry to the world as an ambassador of 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. Listen, this is, the testimony is not to be kept. It's not to be put in a safe and kept. You don't lock it down. You open it up. You share it. Have you been sharing it? Why haven't you? An example of this testimony of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer is evidenced by Peter's sermon at Pentecost when 3,000 people were saved in Acts 2. It shows why people should believe that Jesus came into the world to save sinners like he declared he would in Luke 19.10. Paul declared it, did it, he did it to him in 1 Timothy 1.15. 2 Peter 3.9. God is not willing that any perish. Perish is one of the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin. He's not willing. 
He sent his son so that none, and all you have to do to be saved is believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, and you're saved. And the moment you believe it, you receive eight works of the Holy Spirit. You can find all those all online if you just go look. Go to doctrinalstudies.com. It's, it's a powerful stuff right here. You should read very carefully the gospel message contained in Peter's sermon in Acts 2, 32-36. Compare it with 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. And you ought to read carefully a salvation invitation in that passage of Acts 2. Watch 37-41. through 41. Because we're told the gospel is the power of God unto the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. My, my. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful program of salvation, not by works. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself, not of works. It's by grace. Let me conclude. The indwelling Holy Spirit will testify. That's our passage, 15, 26, 27 will testify about Jesus Christ, listen to me now, from the study of God's word. Whatever, whatever you come in agreement with God about in his word, the Holy Spirit will give testimony as the spirit of truth. Would you believe that the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, that that gospel... That Jesus Christ died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. And I read Romans 1 saying it says, the gospel is the power of God unto everyone who believes. See, I got it. If I believe that, I get saved. How am I saved? I am saved by grace, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Am I saved by grace through faith? Not of myself as a gift of God, not of works, least any man should boast. See how it works? Once that's pulled together in my mind scripturally, I have the witness from me. I have the witness to me when I begin to put all that stuff together scripturally in my soul. And I go like, oh, yeah, that's, that's, how you, that's how that thing is done. Then that witness goes from me to others. I become the ambassador for Christ. I tell to somebody, listen, you're born in Adam's sin. There are 13 judicial charges under you. For example, everybody's born spiritually dead, spiritually blind. They're perishing. They're lost. They're a sinner. And the list goes on. It just depends how many that person needs to hear. You know, one of them would do it. And salvation counters every one of them. I was spiritually dead. I'm now spiritually alive. I was spiritually blind. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But now I see. Like the blind man, I see. I see it with the, with the eyes of my soul. Listen to what Jesus said in John 5, 39 and 40. He said, you search the scripture because you think that it's in them that you have eternal life. See, they were hunting the search for eternal life. They were looking at all the scriptures dealing with eternal life in a concordance idea. But they were, they were hunting to find eternal life in the scriptures. Listen to what he said now. Listen carefully. It is these that testify of me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you can have eternal life. If you're searching the scriptures for eternal life and you're not willing to pay any attention to Jesus Christ, you will never find eternal life because eternal life and Jesus Christ are synonymous. Listen to 1 John 5, 11 through 13. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this eternal life is in his Son. He who has the Son has eternal life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have eternal life. These things I have written to those of who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know 
that you have eternal life. Now the witness comes from me. Once the witness is established in me uh, on the basis of the word of God, now that witness can come forth from me with, with confidence because I can show them in the word of God. I can show them. And see, what the word of God gives you is evidence of the testimony. Evidence of the testimony. You've got to learn the word of God, people. Just hang in there on our website. We'll help you. The scripture gives us the evidence, the divine truth for the testimony that the indwelling Holy Spirit is giving to us and through us to others. You ought to read 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You ought to read Romans 4, 31 and compare it with Galatians 3, 8. I know that's a lot for you, isn't it? Oh, gosh, you gave me three things to look up. Oh, boy, my, my. How about John 20, 30, 31? These things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. See, again, where is the evidence of the witness? Where is the evidence of the witness? In the word of God. Just go to the New Testament and begin to read the church age information. I gave you places. Where, for example, you ought to read Luke 24, 44 through, 30, through 50. 44 through 50. And you will find in verse 45, it says, you were witnesses of these things. See, that's the testimony. You are witnesses. Witnesses. That's people who are able to give an account of what's happened to them. 1 John 4.14 we have seen and testified, John writes, that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. I write to give you evidence of the testimony. 1 John 5, 9 through 12, I read some of that to you. 1 John 3, 13 through 24 should be read. Verse 24 says, We know by this that he abides in us because of the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. I'm telling you that you have the indwelling. One of the eight works of the Holy Spirit is indwelling. Now what has the great ministry that flows from the indwelling Holy Spirit, why you should walk in the power of the Spirit, Galatians 5.16, so that all of these attributes of the Holy Spirit can be found in your life. He will teach and recall. He will become the testimony to you and from you. And as you study the Bible, he will give you the evidence for your witness. That's what people want is evidence. You go to a court of law, no matter what your witness has got, what, what's the evidence? Can we put the evidence together? He, he will testify of you. He will, he will guide you. He will disclose to you. He will glorify Christ. I mean, all these things, the, the great manifestation of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is just phenomenal. And I'm just talking about the indwelling. One of the eight works is the indwelling Holy Spirit. And that's what I, I'm talking about is what Jesus was talking about, the manifestation of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us the word of God. We've opened it up, Father. I pray they would open their hearts to believe. The Holy Spirit could channel it into the faith cycle where they hear it, they believe it, they apply it, and they complete it so that it can develop transformational living in their life can produce the abundant life that is intended to be through Jesus Christ. We will not live in a world without hostility towards Christ and towards us. It will, it, it, will, it will attack the testimony of Christ to us and from us. And what, what, what is all worth? It is what Christ went to the cross to die for, the souls of mankind. The worth... 
is the production of what Christ came to do. What God's heart is all about. He's not willing that one perish. And, and we are the guide on. We're, we're the... We fill that gap between them and God. It's the testimony that we bear of the truth that the Holy Spirit is able to use to bring to conversion. One of the eight works of the Holy Spirit is regeneration. The Holy Spirit does that when we're faithful to tell them the truth. Make us witnesses, Father. Make us witnesses. May we bear testimony to ourselves by the evidence of the word of God and then carry it to others that you might transform their, their lives as you have ours in Jesus' name. Amen.